Hi, Vicky. Hi, Shane. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, 2023. Oh, I know, it's very exciting. Yeah, I, I almost stepped up and said, happy, what was I going to say, happy new season. Yeah, we're still, we're still in the middle of our final series and our season one because Ooh. I'm great at scheduling. Uh, but it is, in fact, <laughs> <We're done laughs> a okay. new year. And this episode will be the first in the new year. But um, great. but beyond that. So I know recently, if folks have been listening along, and if you haven't, you should, uh, Mm -hmm. that we talked about doing outreach, kind of like science or otherwise. But today, I was wondering what's what's been your most or one of the most rewarding outreach or community service or any type of experience that you've had? Yeah. So I think um, when we first talked about outreach, I talked about like creating program programming at an art fair that I had been involved mm-hmm. with for many years sure. um, in the local area. And I think within that, I always found the most rewarding thing to be when I scheduled like children's programming. Okay. We used to do specifically every year I would um, help organize this like big kids mural. Okay. Which was essentially like, cause we were in an empty, the whole thing was like an empty building and you fill it with art for six weeks and then oh. you like take it out and it's an empty building again. Right. So essentially we would find like a blank wall or a blank mm-hmm. office somewhere in like this empty building and just give kids paint and like, let them go to town. That's awesome. We first tried to have like an actual mural with like, <laughs> here's a minion, here's a, another character, Some like, direction. color them in. And no, 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 it's much <laughs> more fun just to give little kids paint yeah. and let them go wild in on a blank wall because it's so oh. outrageous to their little yeah. minds, right? Um, and that was just always the most rewarding because it was just great to share because they really, really thought they were making, and they and they were, I shouldn't say it that way. I thought they were they making were really, art. They're making art. They, they are making art. Exactly. It's like they, graffiti. It's just like, exactly. This mo- <laughs> you know, they loved everything that they were making. They felt so free and excited to make yeah. it. Um, and we're sharing it with each other and oh. in space. And it was, yeah, really That's fun. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. That's mine. That's mine. Yeah. That's my favorite uh, thing. So I used to pre-print pre pandemic pandemic uh <laughs> i uh, pandemic no that's pan- good pandemic pandemic uh, I had a, uh, a side gig at the National Zoo here in D.C. Right. Um, where I had talked about parts of this before, but yeah, I did yeah. this thing called Snore and Roar. Yeah. Um, and for a reminder for folks, if you haven't been listening along, uh, basically it's we would take groups of mostly families and do behind the scene tours with them. And then we would sleep overnight in the zoo in tents on one of the greens that's right outside of um amazing uh the the big cat so where mostly the lions were and it was such it was I said about it like it's a wild experience you're hearing yeah. sirens in the middle of the night and wolves and uh the lions yeah. roaring and all of that stuff but from the rewarding standpoint i was i was just kind of a host um i, I wasn't one of the let's say animal experts but we would go and talk to keepers uh-huh. and i love the zoo i mean i i no qualms about that. But seeing these kids, one, going like camping overnight in a zoo, a lot of these kids had never camped before, full stop. And right. so that was just a whole new experience for them. And that was really yeah. fun and, and everything else and seeing that happen. But these kids would just light up. You'd get behind the scenes and you'd be, I don't know, like a few feet away from this giant yeah, like lion or a maned wolf or a zebra or whatever it might be. And exposure that you can't get in kind of the normal yeah. experience that's still great. And they would just, folks, like kids who probably just didn't care and their parents drug them into it, they would just light up. Yeah. And I don't know if these are forever transformative experiences, but holy cow, I can, I mean, I'm already, I, I was a biologist and all of that. Yeah. Like, but I can imagine if I would have had that sort of experience at that yeah. younger age, I mean, I would just have that much more of a love for it. So yeah, just seeing seeing these mostly kids just have at least, maybe not their lives changed, but definitely like maybe like a week or a few months changed. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> in a very like developmental obsessed. period of their life. Super cool, super rewarding. Uh, I would love to be a part of that again. Maybe someday I will. Yeah, no, that's, I love that both of our things relate to children 
I think that's yeah. like the biggest thing, right? It's so fun to to help kids see new things or or see new things, new passions, find new passions or new excitements for themselves. Yeah. Well, and they're so impressionable too. And so yeah. hopefully by getting positive impressions, that kind of weighs out right. potentially like some of the other stuff, which yeah. whatever that might be. <laughs> Although I worry about the when you said like a few feet from like a giant lion. Totally safe, Vicky. About what impression. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> like if there's if something bad were to happen, no physical impressions, no children <laughs> were harmed in this experience. <laughs> Science is fascinating, but don't just take my word for it. Join us as we hear stories from scientists for everyone. I'm Shane Hanlon, and I'm Vicki Thompson, and this is Third Pod from the Sun. So today we're talking about outreach, uh, and and no, again, I can't stress this enough. No children were harmed in any of our outreach <laughs> experience. <laughs> we'll have we to say that a few more times before. Yeah, the I know, episode. right? Just like to get all the qualifiers out there. But we are talking outreach uh, because that's literally today's guests job. Uh, and I know that many of the folks we talk to on the podcast are researchers or other folks who put outreach in their job as part of it. They try to include some component of science communication right. or outreach into their work, but that's the job of who we actually have today. That's really exciting. I can't wait to hear hear what they do. Yeah, it's going to be going to be really great. Uh, and so we will get into it. Our interviewer was Ashley Hamer. My name is Dorian Janney. I work for NASA at Goddard Space Flight Center. I work for a contractor called AdNet, and um, I am the Senior Education and Outreach Specialist for the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, which is this really amazing satellite that NASA launched in 2014. It's an international collaboration. We are working closely with Japan, as well as several other countries have satellites that are in our constellation. I serve as an interpreter or kind of as a narrator to to help people who don't really know about the mission better understand why and how we are, in this case, measuring precipitation from space. The other hat I wear for NASA is that I work with a program that's called the GLOBE program, and it's been operating since 1994, and it's basically a way to empower and enable any citizen to just basically use their smartphone technology so that they can collect data and make observations about our environment all over the world from the ground, and then we can compare and contrast those data with our satellite data from above. Wow, that's great. So you are, you're basically, you're the connection between NASA and the public. You're you are helping to to translate everything that they're doing and get the public involved in, in science also. That is such a perfect way of putting it, the kind of interconnective tissue, if you will, between, you know, the amazing things that are being done. And then how can I, how can I translate that? How can I put that into something that is is not only understandable, but also your average person would say, oh, wow, that's cool. And now I understand why that's important, how that helps us as a society. Yeah, that's great. How did you start working for NASA? What, what happened there? Ah, uh, that's really a neat, a neat question. Um, I started off in early childhood special education and absolutely loved it. But after many years passed, I, I kind of got into metacognition, thinking about thinking and, and, and into some, some different types of learning and, and, and thinking, ways of thinking that, that pushed me to move and, and work with older students. Then when, uh, I was teaching fourth and fifth grade. I have a son who now is a scientist at NOAA. He was in fifth grade and he came home from a summer camp and he said, Mom, we got to get a telescope. Well, when your 10-year-old says, Mom, we got to get a telescope, 
you do what you can to get a telescope. So I took on some extra tutoring jobs, got some money. We got a telescope. And what happened was I fell head over heels in love. I would go outside with him and he would explain to me what we were looking at. And the problem was the more I learned, the less I knew. And I just was absolutely just smitten with with all of this information that was out there that I didn't know. So I I found a master's program at Johns Hopkins University that focused on earth-space science, and I joined a cohort, and I got a second master's in earth-space science. So then at that time, I started teaching middle school and high school. I went straight to just teaching science, and I would go in the summers, and I would work for NASA. And in 2011, they asked me, would I consider supporting this satellite mission that would launch in 2014? Now it's been nine years, and and we've been doing great things with this satellite mission. Oh, that's such an inspiring story that you you came to science through your your 10-year-old son. Can I ask, how, how old were you when that happened? Sure. I would imagine at that point, I was probably about 45 and so I, I, like I said, I went back to school and there I was, my kids would sit around the, the table doing their homework and there was mom working on her second master's doing my homework too. I even went on and did some doctoral work, but it just got to be awfully expensive and trying to work full time and, and do that. And I, I also, at that point in time, I'd gotten the job at NASA and for, for what I was doing, I didn't have to have that doctorate, but it was cool. I was studying, my, my focus was studying what 11-year-olds have as their kind of working mental models for distances in the universe. And I came about that because in working with all of my middle school students and teaching them about space, I realized that there were a lot of misconceptions in that some of them thought we could get to the moon in two hours and others thought it would take us 20 years. And it just hit me that in order for them to really understand distances, you know, in the universe, I had to get a feel for what was it like to be in an 11-year-old's head. And that was that was really exciting to, to do that research and do some studies on that. Oh, that's so cool. It sounds like your son was one source of inspiration. Do you have any other sources of inspiration that got you to where you are? My mom was just great in always supporting any kind of strange hobby I would have. She she let me bring home the guinea pigs and, you know, have all the different animals. And I always had bug and butterfly and rock collections. So I would be out in, in my hiking boots um, collecting bugs. And I remember being teased by a couple of the, the kids in my neighborhood that, that I was, you know, that that's what I was into. And I can remember going home and kind of crying and my mom just, you know, rubbing my forehead and saying, you know, sweetie, that's okay. You're, it's okay that you're different. You're, you're just, you, you're different, interested in different things. So just from an early age, I've always been interested in the outdoors and I've always wondered why. I'm, I'm sure I drove my, my parents and my teachers nuts because I never just accepted, you know, a straight answer. Well, I, I want to know why. Well, how? And I find I'm still that way. If I'm out walking in the woods, I'll look at a tree and notice that, that maybe it's got a certain fungus growing around it. And, and then I wonder, uh, wow, is this part of the fungal network that I've been learning about? And everything just kind of then, you know, tastes like more. I need to keep learning more. What is your favorite place to talk about science? Wow, wow, gosh. I I do love it. We, we do a lot of different kinds of tabling. So I will go to the Science and Engineering Festival and have a table and Earth Day at Union Station. I will go to American Geophysical Union to a variety of different conferences. What I love to do is is to engage and inspire, you know, and teach people like, well, here's here's what's going on with this or have them ask the questions and guide them to to different, you know, to to the understanding. It's kind of like, how do I continue to inspire and motivate and, and, you know, communicate this this information that I find so, so interesting And, and something that kind of came from that. Now, one of the main focuses that that I have uh, with the work that I'm doing with the GLOW program is getting lifelong learners 
people like me who are age 55 and older, getting them involved in the GLOW program and in collecting this data and in understanding how and why NASA studies our home planet. And that's a really exciting charge that I would not have considered before uh, as being necessarily an audience that I was so focused on reaching. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, who better to talk to than kind of people who are just like you? You know, you you know how how they think, you know what they need to hear to to become excited. Well, on that note, do you have any funny or memorable stories from your career from from any of these projects from anything? Sure. I mean, I, I guess I have the, I have kind of the, these funny stories that th- things that will happen all the time, particularly when I'm interacting with with the public. One time I was telling some kids about the fact that water is in a cycle and that we use the same water again and again. And, you know, that 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 probably a long, long time ago, that water was dinosaur pee. So a little girl looks up at me and she goes, oh, so dinosaurs are the ones who made water. (laughs) I was like, oh, no, now I've created a super misconception. And, uh, you know, so that, I thought that was just kind of a, a, a funny thing. And I've always got to be aware of that as a science communicator It is to get a feel for what people's preconceptions are regarding any kind of natural phenomena. And then if, if it's a different conception, an alternate conception than, than what we know as scientists, then kind of helping to scaffold that, to bridge that gap, and and then also to listen to make sure I haven't created created more confusion in the in the meantime. It sounded like from what you were saying about the 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 ten year olds or ten and eleven year olds that those preconceptions can be all over the place. How do you kind of figure out what someone's preconceptions are? That's such a good question. And I guess really two ways. One is interacting with the general public of all ages, because I feel like without that interaction, you really are in a vacuum. But but then the other is noting what those kind of questions were and, and things that they wonder about, and then learning, learning, learning. So right now I'm teaching a course to lifelong learners on climate change and how NASA uses satellite technology and airborne missions to help us look at vital signs to help us understand climate change. And so I'm always reviewing um, not just misconceptions about climate change, but let's say I'd ask me, you know, a question about, well, how is it that that we know what the atmosphere was like 11,700 years ago. And so I will go to multiple sources to be able to then come back and and give information. So, so it's a, it, it's really a, a twofold combination of of knowing how to go and get valid, reliable information, you know, from the American Geophysical Union, from NASA, from NOAA, from there's a great many sources that you know when you go to have, have reliable and valid data, but then also finding a way that I can listen to what it is they're asking so that I'm answering the question that they're asking versus, you know, versus creating more confusion. I think a big challenge is the fact that we have now such a sophisticated way of understanding things, i.e. the technology, and we have such sophisticated understandings in science that it is very challenging sometimes to then communicate that to the general public, to to politicians, to voters, and helping your average person to understand how that technology does yield in valid understandings. And another thing that I, I also think is is kind of a challenge. So when I had begun teaching, Pluto was a planet. And then during my, my teaching, Pluto was demoted. And I, I had a, a colleague come in to me and say, I'm so sorry. I heard about Pluto. And I remember saying to her, oh, this is so exciting. This is how science works. Pluto doesn't care. Pluto's still there. Pluto still is recognized as a a super important component of our solar system. But what's happened is that we've broadened our understanding, utilizing, you know, more sophisticated technology. And that's just forced us then to need to come kind of come up with a new conceptual scheme. So I'm saying all this to say that some of the challenges we have as scientists and science communicators 
are that when we are trying to help the public understand things, we have to we have to find ways to make it understandable and and we also have to help with this narrative that yes, sometimes is going to change. It doesn't mean that the facts are going to change. It doesn't mean that that nothing can be believed because everything's going to change. So it's it's a it's a complicated and um and and challenging road to walk in in helping people to to know that that yes, there are facts in science, and yes, those facts will change. But but that doesn't mean that that things aren't real. That we don't know what we're talking about. Oh, that's very, that's great advice. What personal achievement are you most proud of? I am I am super stoked that I that I work for NASA. There's 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 truly not a day when I I don't just kind of wake up and and feel you know feel satisfied that that I am in a situation where I can continue to learn because I I love to learn and I can I'm in an, a very very I would say an environment that values and appreciates questioning and dialogue and discourse and and you know really working to understand how our natural world works and then also to make that information available to decision makers. I I would have to say that that just being in this situation where I can reach out to people who are say using the data from the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. I'll give an example. There's a, a really fascinating um, civil and environmental professor named Faisal Hussein at the University of Washington. And he is using our data to help banana farmers and wheat farmers in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, who normally would be taking water from, from the very, very valuable freshwater rivers where, where they would they would take the water from those freshwater rivers to irrigate their fields, but uh, over the last twenty years, that pr- fresh water has become less available and so important to so many other people, and so helping them to come up with a behavior change where Faisal Hussein figured out a way and worked with the government that these farmers could get just burner cell phones where they would just get a text telling them water or irrigate. And with irrigate, they go and and open up the rivers. And when it says, or or, or the other one says, don't irrigate, and it tells them that it will rain. So, you know, that way they, they are not using those valuable freshwater resources. And they're they're still getting their crop, but the people then have more freshwater resources to use. So that's the sort of thing that I feel is just a super achievement, is being able to to reach out to these people, to hear what they're doing, and then say, wow, how cool is that, that, that you know, that, that this sort of use of technology is being done, understanding that these farmers are generally not in a position to understand how to access this this satellite data, but ensuring that they have it in a way that is useful and, and easily accessible to them. And then that's also helping to to make our society better. So that 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 I would say is a big achievement. And then finally, I just want to give you a chance to plug anything you want, especially the Globe Project. How can people get involved with that? Oh, excellent. Well, what you can do is if you if you have a smartphone, go to the App Store and find an app called Globe, G-L-O-B-E, Observer. And that's a free app. It is NASA sponsored. We also are supported by NOAA, the Department of State, and the National Science Foundation. So get out there, try the app out, Give it a give it a you know run around the around the the neighborhood. Basically, with that, you're looking at clouds. You're looking for potential mosquito breeding habitats, measuring tree height, and looking at land cover. And you're doing all of this simply with your smartphone. All the directions are in the app. You don't need any fancy equipment. You just need for for each of these about five, maybe ten minutes. And it's a great way of of kind of being connected with your environment. Not only that, but it kind of gets you looking at saying, huh, who else was looking at potential mosquito habitats around the world today? And what did they find? And you're kind of part of this group of people who are uh, who are 
collecting this information and, and kind of find it interesting. And also, if you do collect it and get interested, we have a couple of campaigns, one called Trees Around the Globe, another one called Globe Mission Mosquito, and we have monthly webinars. We just kind of share some of the ways in which these data are being used by different people to make the Earth a better place and to better understand our home planet. Vicky, yeah. <laughs> how are you, how are you making our planet a better place? How am I making it a better place? Yeah, we're we're um, holding ourselves accountable in the year of twenty twenty three. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, so this podcast, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, Vicky, you took my answer. Darn. <laughs> okay. But the other thing was, I was going to circle back to something we discussed during fall meeting. And okay. I'm really going to start composting. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. That's just a very small thing. But hey, you know what? Little things count. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't have a good answer for this. I'm just going to try to be a better person. So here we are. Aww. Oh. <laughs> uh, and I really appreciate, on a serious note, the work that folks like Dorian do yeah. to not only communicate science, but to really get folks engaged with it. Because, again, going back to the purpose of the podcast, if the more folks understand it and can relate to it and are interested in it, then I think that's just a great thing. So thank you again to Dorian for sharing her work with us. And with that, that's all from Third Pod from the Sun. Special thanks to Ashley Hamer for conducting the interview and to NASA for sponsoring this series. This episode was produced by Jason Rodriguez and me with audio engineering from Colin Warren and artwork by Karen Romano Young. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Please rate and review us and you can find new episodes in your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all and we'll see you next week. All right. Do you have an answer to this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not that interesting. That was rude to myself. It is interesting. It's so interesting. <laughs> Vicky, you shouldn't be self-deprecating. You should be like, yeah, I I it's am very amazing. Self- so that's just part of my personality. And it's always weird when I encounter somebody that doesn't understand that. And they're like, oh, no, I really feel like you're great. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I don't really believe that I'm. Right. Exactly. As, like, I don't believe these words coming I'm, out of my mouth. I'm actually yeah. quite awesome. It's just the thing I say. Yeah. Yeah. I really oh, like there. myself. Yeah. Well, oh, goodness. See, this is this is good. We're starting off 2023 with some good self-affirmation. Yeah, you got it. I like me. I like me.